presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. I'm with the Greeks though, the character is destiny. Um, you are essentially, when you hire a president of the United States, we are hiring a person, not a set of policies. What kind of character is needed to be president? A conversation with presidential biographer John Meacham about personality and power, next on Dialogue. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marsha Franklin. We hear a lot about character when it comes to what makes a good president, but one leader's strengths may be seen as fatal flaws in another. So are there qualities that most presidents need in order to achieve their goals? One person who's pondered and written about that question for years is my guest today. John Meacham is a best-selling author whose books include Thomas Jefferson, The Art of Power, Franklin and Winston, an intimate portrait of an epic friendship, and the Pulitzer Prize winning biography of President Andrew Jackson, American Lion. His most recent book is Destiny and Power, the American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush. Mr. Meacham, who's currently the executive editor at Random House, comes to his craft after several decades as a journalist. He began his career at the Chattanooga Times and went on to become the editor of the Washington Monthly and Newsweek magazine, as well as a contributing editor at Time magazine. Now, Mr. Meacham was in Boise as the keynote speaker for the 2016 Distinguished Humanities Lecture, sponsored by the Idaho Humanities Council. And we thank that group for sharing his time with us. Welcome. Thank it's you. It's great to have you in Idaho. Thanks have for you, having me. Have you been here much before? This is my maiden voyage. Wow. It's very exciting. There weren't any trumpets at the airport, but I'm working on I'm hoping <laughs> that when I leave. Maybe people, you'll get a red carpet. Well, people will be later. so excited when I leave, though, probably. <laughs> well, you know, I would be remiss if we didn't start out this conversation by talking about what is the present moment. You and I are sitting here in the run-up to the 2016 presidential election. Right. And also known as the apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And of course, there's nothing completely analogous to it in history because we have not seen a woman in the past right. uh, from a major party get to this uh, a point. But I'm wondering, can you think of anything similar to this campaign in terms of its tone? Well, the tone is, as Mark Twain once said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so this, from the beginning, uh, 1796, which was the first competitive race, uh, there were Federalist newspapers that said you could have John Adams and God or Jefferson and no God. Uh, in 1800, uh, Jefferson was attacked for his relationship with uh, Sally Hemings. Uh, 1828, Andrew Jackson believed that uh, John Quincy Adams' attacks had led to his wife's death. Um, so that part is, 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 is somewhat familiar. What is different about 2016 is we've never had a populist outsider take over the mechanics of an existing major party. And so the Republican nominee was in fact a, uh, an unprecedented uh, force in this. Uh, you mentioned the fact that uh, we obviously have the first major party, uh, female major party nominee. Uh, which inter interestingly kind of got lost in the shuffle, uh, it's, which is, a, is worth thinking about. You know, my own view is that presidential politics are almost always an expression of where we are culturally. And one of the questions we have to wrestle with is, given the partisan divide in the country, given the polarization, uh, the fact that the many, many people who self-identify as Democrats or Republicans can't even begin to think that they might actually cross the aisle and vote for someone else. What does that sense of permanent division tell us about who we are as a people? And I don't think it's a particularly happy story. Well, going back to the fact that uh, there is a, a, a woman running, do you think some of the tenor is because of that as well or I not? Think, I think it probably exacerbates it. Um, but, you know, we're in an era of firsts. Uh, wonderfully uh, in the, here in the first decades of the 21st century. Uh, we've had the first African-American president. Um, uh, we had the first populist outsider take over a party, uh, the first woman uh, at this level. Um, so sure, it's, it's, it's a force. Um, I've been very struck by how, particularly among millennial young women, the, the first nature, the, uh, the glass ceiling nature, seems to have very little impact 
they're sort of not interested in it. Um, I teach at Vanderbilt. Uh, I, I talk to students all the time uh, around the country. And as recently as this week, uh, one said, it just doesn't matter. And they thought that was good news, that this is part of their reality, that remember eight years ago, Obama and Clinton were running against each other. And so they sort of came into this movie with an African-American and a woman fighting for the, for the nomination. And in that sense, that's true, that's progress. Let's talk about presidential uh, character because that's certainly been on trial um, sure. in, in this election and, and in others. As I mentioned, mentioned in my introduction, uh, what one voter can see is an asset, let's just right. say plain talking, telling it like it is. Right. Others can see as a real deficit being boorish, thuggish, uh, speaking without thinking first. In the end, character, or presidential character, seems so uh, subjective. Character is subjective, right? Uh, you're exactly right. The French have a proverb for this. Uh, someone has the vices of their virtues. Uh, and I'm with the Greeks, though, that character is destiny. Uh, you are essentially, when you hire a president of the United States, we are hiring a person, not a set of policies, because you never know what history is going to throw at them. Uh, in 2000, George W. Bush ran against the projection of force uh, around the world. After the attacks of September 11th, he changed his mind. Uh, but the character of the man was the same, though the policy, the policy shifted. Um, I think there are three characteristics out of the folks I've written about uh, and gotten to know in, in the case of President Bush that are important. One is humility, not in the sense of St. Francis and no politician is going to walk through the streets with sackcloth and ashes. You know, that, that's not part of the job description. But a humility in the sense of being able to admit a mistake. So when John Kennedy came in and he blew the Bay of Pigs, he called President Eisenhower. He got a lesson in how to govern better. October 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis, he does it better. He learned, he was, but he was able to do that in part because he was able to reach out and say, I got this wrong, help me get this right. That capacity is hugely important. Uh, empathy is hugely important. Uh, George H.W. Bush, and again, I'm not talking about I, I feel your pain kind of Bill Clinton stuff, but the capacity in, in diplomacy and in negotiations with the Congress to put yourself in the other person's shoes, to see what their aspirations, their anxieties, their hopes, their fears are. Uh, George H.W. Bush uh, was one of the most empathetic men who ever held the office. Um, he was a buttoned up wasp, and so you didn't see it all the time, but George H.W. Bush weeps at the drop of a hat. If there's a heavy dew, he starts to cry. Um, and there's a direct line with Berlin Wall comes down, he uh, is urged by the Democrats to go over and declare an end to the Cold War, to stick it in Gorbachev's ear. Uh, I think he meant I, but that was, that was George Bush. Writing about George Bush, by the way, is a little bit like writing a biography of Dana Carvey. Uh, sort of, you know, uh, Mr. Rogers trying to be John Wayne. Um, but that empathy, he, he knew that Gorbachev was going to have problems if he went over and declared victory. And so he, he managed that. But famously, uh, as you say, he was not able to show that, you know, there was a, a debate in which he was asked, yep. uh, in a town hall <clears throat> debate, you know, d can you really feel what we're feeling? And right. he, he was not able to articulate it that. Was, so yeah. there's something also about being able to transmit that. It was a harrowing yeah. moment. That was, that was yeah. Richmond, 1992. He had just looked at his watch. He's left-handed, so his watch is on his right hand. Uh, he actually says, I just don't get it. The Clinton aides in the back were high-fiving each other. Um, but that was a case where style and substance were actually a part. Um, uh, the third thing, so, is, is a sense of, of an ability to compromise, an ability to recognize that you don't have a monopoly on the truth. Uh, Ronald Reagan used to say, if I can get 60% of what I want and I'll go back and fight for the 40, I'll take it. Uh, in recent years, uh, really since, I'd argue since 1992, 1994, Washington has been incentivized not to do the 60-40 deal. They want 100 or nothing. How much is being a gentleman or a gentlewoman yeah. part of this uh, character needed? Uh, you know, you almost named your book about George H.W. Bush, The Last, Last Gentleman. Gentleman. Yeah. And uh, I, it's been intriguing for me to watch the Bush family, whether it's uh, overt in the case of the granddaughter, Lauren, or not, or just implied, say that many of them say that they're not going to support the Republican nominee. I'm wondering right. how much of that has to do with a temperament issue, a character issue that they see in 
oh, the I candidate yeah. not being in their mind a gentleman? I think the, the, the issue with the word gentleman is that I think in, in our popular mind, it tends to have class connotations, uh, which to me, and one of the reasons I didn't call the book that, because it made him seem fustier than he is. Uh, this was a man who at the age of 20 was shot out of the sky over the Pacific. At the age of 18, he becomes the youngest pilot in the Navy. Uh, this is someone who was driven by an ethos of, of ambition, yes, but also of, of, of service. And, it, uh, and had other people's lives in his hands uh, at an age before he could vote uh, in, those, in those days. Um, you know, President Bush, 41, is not going to vote for Trump. Uh, uh, he's going to vote for Hillary, which is a striking thing. He's going to vote for the man, the wife of the man who defeated him. Now think about that for a second. That's Shakespearean uh, in a way. Um, I don't think it's about class. I don't think it's about manners, although manners are morals, as Jane Austen taught us. But I do think it's about a degree of empathy, a degree of dignity, and a capacity to think about the other person. Um, not just because of forks and sp which spoon to use, but because diplomacy and politics runs on what Franklin Roosevelt once referred to as the science of human relationships. And if you can't convince people, people are not, the founders were always talking about this, people tend not to simply be convinced because you tell them they're wrong. If you and I are debating something and I say, no, that's wrong, and here's why I'm right, you're probably not likely to say, oh, you're so, it's so right, I'm so glad you were here to correct me. What I have to do is say, you know, that's a great point. And you know what, and I, I thought about that point, and this is how I got to where I am. And so we got there together. That's, that's an empathetic way. Is it manipulative? Sure. But we're living, you know, the root of the word politics is city, and the root of the idea of a city is, is a collection of people. Um, St. Augustine once defined a nation as a multitude of rational beings united by the common objects of their love. And I think if we're really honest right now, uh, Americans don't love enough in common. And this is not a partisan point. I voted for candidates of both parties. I expect to continue to do so. Um, but we pick our news sources. We filter our friends. Uh, we don't tend to have contact with people outside our immediate world of experience and, and shared values. And I think that whoever the president is going forward uh, in a digital age that exacerbates those divisions as opposed to bringing them together has a big, big burden to uh, try to keep it. What do we love in common? What do we love in common? And I think that's going to be a key to presidential leadership in the 21st century. And some of it goes to the sociability that you talk about yeah. in the book about Jefferson, yeah. about ha having sociability. Well, ability. Ha be knowing each other. Uh, and it was very much a, a reality of Thomas Jefferson's that, and the founders, Gordon Wood writes about this brilliantly, that, um, that a republic depends on our capacity to understand where our neighbor is. So if we look at a candidate and we don't perceive that that candidate has very many friends. Yeah, that's interesting. It, it, is that a, is a sign perhaps that that individual I don't think it's a good sign. is closed off from what's... I don't think it's a good sign. Richard Nixon, you know, I mean, he and Bibi Rebozo were there bowling. Um, Intro introverts, it's an interesting question. Uh, we do tend, it's, it's, odd, it's, a, it's odd, isn't it? Uh, we do tend to elect either highly extroverted people or highly introverted people. So President Obama is pretty introverted. Very, yeah. Jimmy Carter was introverted. Uh, Bill Clinton and George H.W. Bush were hugely extroverted. Um, President Reagan, as ever, screws up the, 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 the example. <laughs> uh, you know, Reagan loved the people en masse. Uh, he used to keep one contact in so that he could keep an eye on how the audience was reacting uh, while he was reading the teleprompter. Uh, a brilliant performer. Uh, we still haven't quite conjured with the, the impact he's had on, on the life of the country. Um, but yes, I, th I think in choosing presidents, in choosing senators, in choosing governors, in choosing anyone we would trust with affairs larger than, than our household, uh, I think knowing how they are in social settings with other people is important. You know, one of the things that I felt you emphasized in your book about Jefferson was his passion for reason. As you say, reason took the place of revelation for right. him. 
Um, and and you, you wrote, we've lost the sense that politics in, is informed by the life of the mind that Jefferson yeah. had. So again, looking at presidential character, <clears throat> do you sense it's important that a president be well read, be mm. what some people would call intellectual? Or is that going out of favor now because it's viewed as if, Eddie. <laughs> well, elite, yeah. effete, yeah. Uh, out of touch, uh, unable to govern if you're a policy wonk. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I know somebody who said, I don't want a professor running my country. Right. So what about this life of the mind and how important it is in presidential character? Well, all, every great American leader has been in touch with the broad intellectual cultural currents of their time. Uh, whether it was Jefferson and the Enlightenment and the idea of, of individual rights, uh, whether it was Jackson and Lincoln in tune with the rising democratic lowercase d uh, spirit and world in the, in the United States, whether it was Ronald Reagan having the insight to switch parties in the early 1960s uh, and become a Republican, um, whether it was Bill Clinton understanding the rise of the digital age, um, and so I think uh, transformative political leaders are not isolated somehow from, from those broader currents. Uh, you're exactly right about the dangers of being, appearing to be an egghead, uh, which was a phrase used to, to attack Adelaide Stevenson back in the 1950s. Uh, George H.W. Bush used to read books, but he didn't want people to know it. And I blame that on Texas, uh, the Texas politics of the age, because he was Here's a, here's, here's a man who had gone to Greenwich Country Day School, Andover, and uh, Yale, and he's in Texas trying to run for office. So he used to say, I don't want people thinking I'm an intellectual. Um, but, so I think, I think you have to manage that. Um, Pete, here's, here's the thing. I don't think people mind if you are engaged in a broader conversation, if you're thinking out big issues. What they don't want is to feel that you believe because you are engaged in dealing with those ideas, that somehow or another you are better than they are, that you are smarter than they are. So it really comes back to character, to your first point. It comes back to the capacity of a person in power to be engaged in the life of the mind, but not to appear to be lording it over those who are fighting their way to get through what George Eliot called the dim lights and tangled circumstance of the world, the folks who are trying to feed their kids put some money away, make sure their job is secure. In this digital age, in this age of 24-hour cable, television, kind of confessional. Uh, it's like Dante. <laughs> <laughs> well, how important is it to show a little bit more of yourself than you might have shown in the past, say, in George H. W. Bush's yeah. life, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton is, Clinton is criticized because she seems so buttoned up. She hasn't expressed right. her feelings about what happened right. uh, when her husband was unfaithful. That she's uh, too constrained, secretive, not about re not relatable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, there that is a lesson of of, of President Bush's defeat in 1992. Uh, there was beginning really with cable television um, and the capacity of political media to go all day long. Um, remember, uh, without Larry King, there's no Ross Perot. Uh, without uh, CNN, and in, in those days it was only CNN, uh, Clinton would have had a harder time. Uh, the rise of political talk shows, which was a cable phenomena in many ways, um, you know, that changed at least the political conversation, which is not always the national conversation. In fact, isn't very often. Sometimes the two intersect, but not always. But what President Bush's defeat in 1992 has taught, I think, subsequent candidates is you do, you, you can't have the moment where you look at your watch. You know, you can't say, I don't get it. Um, and that was a world for him that was simply foreign. Uh, his son learned that lesson. Uh, certainly. Uh, I think Secretary Clinton will end up doing that. I mean, I, I can't imagine the psychological wear and tear of having spent 25 years uh, having every possible thing I say or do scrutinized and attacked. Um, the other thing I don't think we've thought about in terms of with Hillary Clinton is 
you know, she is a kind of, gen not only is she a pioneer in the gender politics, but she's a generational pioneer. So we forget this, but her emergence in 1992 was really the first working woman sort of coming into the national conversation. And that raised all sorts of questions for people, women particularly of the previous generation, who had made different choices, who had been constrained in many ways. And so uh, political figures often, whether they like it or not, have to deal with the projected feelings of the electorate and the projected ambivalence of the electorate. And I think that's going to be true with Hillary Clinton uh, until the last hour. I want to ask about the plain speaking, says it like it is quality of Donald Trump. Some people really like that as an aspect mm -hmm. of character. Do you think that's a character characteristic yeah. that is good for a president to just shoot from the hip, and, so to speak? I think, to paraphrase Winston Churchill, I think it's a good starter but not a good finisher. Uh, I think it's unquestionable that uh, his nomination uh, and those who stuck with him to the end uh, and voted for him for president were people who are so furious at the political class, at what the uh, ordinary expectations and conventions of politics had produced in the life of the country, that they were basically willing to blow the whole thing up. Uh, blow up the science lab. And so it was brilliant uh, as a tactical maneuver. Strategically, I think less so. Do you think we're seeing a complete rending of the Republican Party? Will there be some who need to start a different party, like say the party of Link Lincoln yeah. Party or something like that? I don't see how they don't, honestly, because I don't think, I don't think Trump's going anywhere. Um, how they don't what? I don't say how they don't. There's not some kind of split, uh -huh. organizational split. Um, because, you know, parties break up. The Whigs in the 1850s, uh, the Democrats changing fundamentally in the 1960s over race, and the Republicans the same, uh, becoming the Southern Party. Um, parties change fundamentally or die or, and are reborn when they fail to achieve majority consensus on the central issue of the time. So slavery, civil rights, and now it's globalization. It's globalization and its implications. And right now the Republican Party cannot make up its mind whether it's an open borders party or a closed borders party. And there's some Democrat, there's Democratic energy on this too. I mean, Senator Sanders represented a, a, a left wing version of this um, about wanting to be more protective of the homeland in terms of the economy. Um, and so I think, uh, I don't know quite how it works. Because of the Electoral College, we have a, uh, there's an institutional bias within the political system to only have two parties. Because if you don't get a majority of the Electoral College, then it goes to the House of Representatives. So therefore, whoever owns the House, of, whoever uh, controls the House of Representatives uh, has a, um, an advantage. So having three national parties is very difficult. Yeah, it'll be fascinating. Another thing that's fascinating to me is that uh, Donald Trump actually reached out to President George H.W. Yeah. Bush in 1988 and said, hey, if you need a vice presidential candidate, yep. I'm... Yep. President Bush in his diary, the, the, the overture came after um, conversations with uh, Lee Atwater and Donald Trump, apparently. And um, when Bush was talking about it into his diary, he said, strange, unbelievable. <laughs> I know... Uh, Michael Beschloss feels that you have to wait at least 20 years to be right. able to look back and assess a presidency. But what is your sense so far, at least character-wise, about the presidency of Barack Obama? I think, I think history is going to treat him incredibly kindly. Um, I think his biography, the fact, that, uh, the fact of his presidency uh, will be discussed as long as the English language is spoken in any corner of the globe, uh, as Churchill once put it. Um, I think that depending on what happens in Syria and, and, and the Middle East, what happens with Iran and the ultimate, uh, does the Iran nuclear deal work, ultimately will be two things that historians will watch and that Obama will be accountable for going forward. But, but aside from policy, how do you think oh, President Obama 
will be looked at in terms of his, his character and how he's uh, comported himself in office? Well, he's, he's, he's comported himself with great, with great dignity. The, the only downside, and the question is going to be interesting for, to unfold, unpack th over the next 20 years and beyond, is, is the caricature that he is Mr. Spock, that he's too cool, that he's too logical, that, and again, the, the, the conventional wisdom is that he did not enjoy the give and take of politics and therefore was not able to accomplish as much domestically as, as he would have hoped. Is that true? That's going to be a big historical question to unpack. And what's next for you? I know you've talked about publishing the Bush diaries that um, you relied upon for your biography of him. I am. That's that has to be posthumous. Uh, his death, not mine. Although I could go first. <laughs> uh, he's fine uh, at ninety-two uh, and chugging along. I am going to do the president's diaries. Um, it's a fascinating document. It's an audio diary he kept two or three times a week um, as president. It's probably the last one. Um, his lawyers didn't want him to keep it, uh, but he did anyway. Uh, but I'm going to do James and Dolly Madison as a narrative next. Um, uh, two people who uh, I think should have a, uh, be held in even higher historical regard uh, because of their critical role in the formation of the country. As we wrap up, um, I want to quote back to you something that you've... you've uh, That's always dangerous. Said. <laughs> well, you, you said, I think what many great presidents have in common is an appreciation of the tragedy of history. We're never going to work all this out. I right. mean, Americans in their movies and their culture, it seems right. to me, often like to have things tied sure. in, a, in a nice little neat bow. It's sure. not how it works. Nope, 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 not since the garden, uh, not since Eden. Uh, no, I, I believe that. Uh, Lincoln understood the tragedy of history, Jefferson understood it. Um, I think, I think I think people who think about the nature of reality realize that we're never going to get all the way there. It's the reason we tried to form a more perfect union, not a perfect union. Well, thank you. Thanks very Thanks, much Mark. for sharing your thoughts during this incredibly interesting time. I, I really appreciate it. Well, thank you. As the Chinese said, it's, it's a curse also. But we live in interesting times. So <laughs> thank you. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have. You've been listening to John Meacham, who's written best-selling biographies of Presidents Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, and George H.W. Bush. For more information, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to IdahoPTV.org and click on Dialogue. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Check out our website, become a friend on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter. 